Welcome to the Music Journal Podcast, where we talk about the hottest things happening in music right now, and also how you can apply it if you're an aspiring producer or musician yourself. I'm your host, Wes Yi. I'm a producer, artist, and educator, and I'm stoked to be chatting with you. Let's make history. All right, welcome to another episode of the Music Journal Podcast. Today's guest is Zeke Zelker. So it's kind of a funny story. Zeke and I actually met about a year and a half ago at the first show I ever did performing my own personal original music. And I was doing the show with my friend's band, Dead Poet Society, and Zeke was filming their tour. And if you remember from a previous episode, Jack Collins was actually on the show too. He's a member of Dead Poet Society playing guitar. But Zeke is a professional filmmaker and director, and he's currently working on a film right now. It's called Billboard. They're doing some really cool cutting-edge stuff. He's got a successful internet radio station called WTYT that features bands who submit their music and gives them an opportunity to grow and showcase what they can do. And I feel like for the past year and a half or so, Zeke and I have just been kind of following each other from a distance and liking each other's Facebook statuses and stuff like that. So it's cool to have him actually here right now and, uh, and on the show. Zeke, welcome to the Music Journal. Hey, thanks for having me, Wes. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I gave kind of like a brief synopsis of who you are and what you do, but obviously you have a long backstory. Do you want to share some of it? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I've been making films for over 20 years now, um, very independently, uh, totally outside the studio system uh, with success uh, because we are doing things a bit differently than what my peers are doing in terms of building out story worlds, just not linear storylines where the audience can jump in and jump out of various um, story aspects. Um, and we, we build community and build audience around our project very early on. Hence why we started WTYT960.com. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I do is, is, is a test for bigger things and, and kind of like the next things out there. Um, and that's what's kind of fun about it because so we, we, we make things and break things. Uh, we entertain people along the way. Um, and it just is, I feel like, the new paradigm in storytelling. I'm really intrigued by what you mean by the audience can jump in and out. Like, are they, are they actually, is it an interactive experience or what, uh, what specifically are you doing that's, that's different and kind of separates you from other films that have already been done? Sure. So uh, with Billboard, um, we're telling two different uh, points of view of the same story. So the story is about a radio station, WTYT 960. Um, that hosts a billboard sitting contest or four people live in a billboard to win a mobile home in $960,000. So the feature film focuses purely on the radio station and Casey, the station owner's um, uh, desire to try and maintain his father's legacy because he was, he was aired this, this radio station. Hmm. Uh, so we, so the film was more about the radio station. And then we have a, uh, a 25 episode web series that focuses solely on the four people in the contest. Uh, so it's literally a story told uh, from two different vantage points um, that people could basically, you know, when it gets to the digital side of the uh, of the um, of the release, people could stop the film, watch an episode of the web series, and then have like basically like a five hour journey if they care to care to do it that way, or they could watch the the film, then the web series, or the web series, then the film because it's not redundant content; it's all different content, um, and they all p- tell part of the same story. Mm. That sounds dope because I feel like so much of films and why people connect with films is because of the fact that you can connect and relate with a character. And Mm -hmm. if it's only surface level and you're only seeing the actual plot and the script of the story, um, you're only limited to connecting that much. So if you have this web series, it's kind of going along with the actual plot of the film and everything that's happening. It allows the people who are watching to kind of connect even further with the characters, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting is because what we're really doing too, um, especially by building on WTYT 960, is we're really blurring the lines between truth and fiction, where with the radio station, like you have to realize, like I created this radio station for the project. Um, I wasn't expecting it to grow the way it has. Um, it's, it's kind of a phenomenon, which, I, yeah. which I'm very blessed for, and I don't quite understand it, but it has, <laughs> it has legs of its own. It out, yeah. uh, and, and, so, and so it's funny because like, you know, we, then take, we then do live events like where we met each other in, in, uh, in Boston. Um, you know, so we literally host live events. We have DJs there. We're, we're blurring the lines for truth and fiction. So sometimes people don't know that they're part of a story world and then other people are totally, you know, you know game or they totally understand what's going on. 
It's so funny how unlinear it can be sometimes. Like you think that you create this radio station to go along with this film to help the film, but then the radio station's what kind of takes off. Have you found that that's kind of been the case in your career and your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, yeah, it's always the ancillary things that sometimes um, end up being more successful than than the overall project. I think I think Billboard, the film, is going to do very, very well, thank God. But um, like, for instance, with the radio station, we have over a thousand bands on the site uh, from 49 states. The only holdout is South Dakota. Uh, and we're in 22 different countries. And so it's what kind of cool about what we're doing is bands create profiles, they upload a song. And, but we're aggregating their social media to build out their, their profile on, on our site. So, um, you know, so the more often that an that a artist will um, share or kind of are more active on social media, the more they'll play on our site. Hmm. Um, and so there's kind of like this, this, um, this way, because we firmly believe that artists have to be very entrepreneurial and they also have to promote totally. themselves because you can't rely on other people to do your work for you. Uh, you really need to grab the bull by the horns and and get and get stuff done yourself. Absolutely. Um, so I guess first of all, hopefully someone's listening in South Dakota and submits their music. Maybe they have a band or something that would fit. Um, <laughs> That'd be awesome. That we're in all fifty states, and that's a, that that's a win. That'd be a total win, which would be Hell awesome. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, I hope it happens. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you with the whole like grit perseverance thing. I remember when we met, we connected on a lot of those conversational topics and we're talking about like Gary Vaynerchuk and yep. people like that. Um, what's, what's your story? Like where, where did you come from? Cause I was reading a little bit about your, I was reading your bio a little bit on IMDb and uh, I don't know who wrote it, but whoever wrote it described you as like a scrap dog, somebody who kind of came up from <laughs> the bottom and, and now you're extremely successful. So what was, I guess the turning point or was it like a series of small wins? How would you, how would you describe that process? Um, Okay, uh, that's like basically a twofold question. One is, I'll answer the latter part first. Um, huh. Basically, what's, what's, why I've been successful is I will not quit. Um, I just, I'm in it for the long game. I'm not in it. Uh, the problem with a lot of filmmakers is they feel like they make a film, they go to Sundance, they win a lottery, and they start their careers. Uh, that is literally a lottery. The idea of literally trying to make, you know, put a dollar and make a million dollars um, and the likelihood of that happening is very, very slim. In fact, more people win the lottery than they make um, make money at at, uh, at uh, independent filmmaking. Uh, I hate I hate to be the uh, the you know the, the sober Nelly, but that that's a matter of the matter of fact. So the big thing is, it's like so. What you need to do is you need to apply sound pr business principles to your actual creation. And what I mean by that is. Um, Filmmakers really need to be a lot more business minded and try and figure out ways of, of making revenue, not just um, hoping you're going to get revenue. Right. Uh, like for instance, there's a there's a film that they asked me to invest in. Uh, I looked at their 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 paperwork and I'm like, how many different revenue streams do you have? And they're like, what do you mean? And and they're like, well, it's just a traditional film. I'm like, I'm out. I have no desire because like unless I know that there's more than one different way of making revenue, I'm not interested. So like, for instance, yeah. with, with Billboard, you know, we have, you know, the feature film, we have the web series, we have the radio station, we have live events, we have merchandise, we have uh, a book that everybody's trying to get me to write, a graphic novel, because it's, it's kind of funny, it's based on the film itself, and it's mm -hmm. also interactive play. You know, so there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different revenue streams for this project, and so I really looked at it as a way of uh, doing things, and mind you, this is all within the same story world. This is not like you know, throw off things or anything along those lines. And so to answer the first part of your question is how did I start? And my family, um, I grew up in an amusement park. My family started Dorney Park in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh, really? Uh, oh, no and way. literally, like, it was my playground as a kid. I'd go around you know, with my grandfather doing safety checks. We'd climb, you know, I'd climb a roller coaster and slide down, you know, the tracks on my rear end, like a, you know, 100-foot slide. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, and so, um, but what, what's interesting about that is I learned very early on that you always have an entertainment, right? Throughout the park, you have different sorts of entertainment um, vehicles. Then around that uh, entertainment vehicle or property, you then have different sorts of ways to make revenue. You have your games of chance, you have your merchandise, you have your food. So if artists, musicians alike, create that same sort of idea, it's amazing how successful you'll end up being. And that, that is how I created all of my films. That's why I only make films and I'm making a living off of it. Mm. You know, yeah. so you really have to think about it. Like for instance, you're a musician, 
you know, your hybrid games you play out at. Okay, but then you have merch. Okay, is your merch completely you know, based off of your music or is it something like, like, uh, like an ancillary sort of thing? Okay, so then all of a sudden, like, okay, so how do you make even like more, another way of making revenue? Okay, you, know, you can get sponsorships and things. Um, you know, can you do like, you know, like, hey, the Weshi Spaghetti Dinner, you know, you know, to fund my tour kind of thing. You know what I mean? So like, there's a whole bunch of different things and people just have to be more, you know, entrepreneurial and, and think about things that way than, than just pigeonholing themselves and being very, very siloed. I think that's totally true. I was actually about to uh, relate it to the whole musician thing as well, because a lot of the people listening at home are music producers and aspiring artists. And um, I think a lot of people try to get their quote unquote one big hit, which is not typically how it works. Because like you said, it's playing the lottery as opposed to looking at it as a marathon as opposed to a sprint. So it's kind of about putting out a project and then acquiring some fans and then you put out another one and then the old fans enjoy it and then et cetera, et cetera, you get more fans, but then also creating those multiple streams of income, like you said, with the merch mm -hmm. and everything. But what, but what I think is really cool about the way you do it is that it's all under one umbrella, which is the billboard brand, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, a, that's a really difficult thing to do. Have you ever done anything like that before with your previous films where you have all these different streams of incomes and different uh i guess platforms and mediums of entertainment that are all under underneath one brand or is this kind of the first time you're doing something like that uh to this magnitude uh, it is uh and this is how i'll create from here on out um it is it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to do what i do though mind you for sure um but i've, I've always done additional things in all my projects mm. um you know, for instance, my last film I was sponsored by a condom company. I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> <laughs> but like literally, it was about the repercussions and consequences of people's sexual actions. It was oh, about okay. um, uh, the film's called In Search of. You can find it, you know, online on Amazon and iTunes and everything else. Um, so, like literally, I was sponsored by a condom company, um, and then a whole bunch of crazy stuff happened along that those lines. I did a feature film called I Can't the Wildly World. The film really, really sucked. Quite honestly. Uh, I try. I, I pushed the film into production way too early because my dad always wanted to be in a film and he was dying of cancer. So I oh, literally shit. pushed it into production Darn. way too early. Um, but I ended up making more money on a cocktail book associated with the with the film than I did the actual film itself. Um, so the thing is, is like the moral of the story really is like if you really think hard and long and and open up your mind creatively and create different revenue streams. Every project you have can be successful. You just have to work at it and really think, you know, think differently than, than what you know, your, your peers will, are doing. Absolutely. It's about that, uh, that value mindset as well, I feel like, because that's where the revenue is going to come. It's from giving value to somebody else so that somebody somewhere is going to want to actually pay you money for the product that you're creating, be it the merch or be it the, the live shows or the live events or whatever it is, or the web show. Um, yep. Question, do you have a crazy story from just, I guess, filmmaking in general or your career? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of crazy stories. <laughs> I've risked my life quite a bit uh, doing no crazy way. stuff. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, a, it's all, uh, give me like, like you want one from Billboard? You want one from another, another one or, 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 or what? Why don't we... Uh... Why don't we pick two so it's a little easier so you don't have to pick just one crazy story. But uh, if you want to pick one from Billboard and then maybe one from a previous film or something. Okay, sure. So uh, in Billboard, um, we had this big aerial uh, aerial shots. And I have a friend who is a pilot. Um, he has a helicopter. And I asked him that I needed to do this this shoot. Uh, we got some beautiful, beautiful you know shots of the cities and things. But then I told him that I had to follow a Jeep. And so we're literally down, this is during rush hour, of course, uh, evening rush hour. And so we are um, chasing a Jeep about 80 feet off the ground, going 80 miles an hour down a, down a highway uh, in rush hour. Damn. Uh, and it was, it was, we literally are, are hanging out of the side of the, of the, of the, uh, of the helicopter getting these shots. Uh, and it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. So when we, when we end up getting back to the, uh, to the, to the hangar, uh, state troopers were there waiting for us. Uh, because what they said what we were doing was highly illegal, yeah, but right. uh, much to, much to their um, dismay, my pilot actually had all clearance for it, okay. and you could fly a helicopter anywhere. Um, and and so like you know, my pilot basically stood up to him, be like, "No, you're 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 full of crap. That's not true." And yada yada yada, leave me alone. And so we we literally got this beautiful footage that didn't 
that I ended up using some of it, but not all of it in the film. Um, but that was like, you know, a very harrowing experience. Um, and just pushing, you know, to try and get, we're going underneath wires. It was, it was insane. Damn, it was really way. cool, but also insane at the same time. Yeah. Um, and um, I generally get in trouble with the authorities at some point on one of my shoots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're doing yeah. crazy stuff like that, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and it just is, is um, uh, you know, you, but you have to push the envelope. You know, we've got totally. some beautiful stuff totally and things. Worked. And I mean, mind you, we, we, we were within uh, the law, uh, but it's just a matter of, you know, just, just pushing the boundaries a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, yeah, then, then actually another, like, really crazy story was on, a, was on a, um, a feature film that I did a number of years ago, um, and uh, I, had a, I had a nemesis in, in town um, who really did not want me to succeed. And we have never really been able to place it on him, but we were doing a test screening of, of one of my films. And the day before, everything in my studio was, they, they broke into my house, stole everything associated with the film and nothing no else. Jesus. Um, and so basically so that, that, you know, we couldn't be, you know, carry on and little do people know that I always have two copies of everything I do in two different places, not even at my studio. Um, so Sorry. we thank God the show went on, but it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing of like how petty and how, how ridiculous people could end up being, um, because of, of, of jealousy. Yeah. You know? And it's sad. It's like, yeah, I'm sure musicians have the same sort of idea of people like freaking, you know, blowing somebody's amp or, or, or things along those lines. People but steal gear and stuff. on tours. Yeah, it's, no, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, pathetic yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, cause that's, that's their own time and their energy that they're spending to make somebody else's project more difficult and to make their life harder so you have to imagine how they must feel about themselves to actually want to go out and do something like that just to just to feel better about themselves you know what i mean oh i know i know it's sad it really yeah. is sad nobody treats anybody worse than they treat themselves i think is the is the underlying thing there but there's a value bomb in that which is to always keep a double copy of everything because um I just mixed and mastered an album for a pretty big up and coming artist. He's toured with like Joyner Lucas and Hobson. And, oh, awesome. uh, and I did not keep a backup of the project, which was not smart because my computer hard drive crashed. Oh, you're kidding. The project. Yeah, four months in. And the recovery process was a nightmare. Luckily, we were able to recover it. And then I was able to get Pro Tools back, which is what I used to actually make the music and mix and master everything by grabbing an old backup off an old drive. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a fucking nightmare, and uh, oh, I, I can only imagine. Send to me. Yeah, so are you backing up everything every single time now? Uh not as often as I should. I actually got a a little uh, blurb from Time Machine last night saying it's been like thirty days since I've done a backup, but definitely better than I was before, which is kind of what's all about, right? Just slow progression. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can't change too quick overnight, or else then then you know, you don't carry through with things. Hmm. Do you think that you had like a like a quote unquote big break, or do you think it's really no. been just like that that slow, slow progression? Slow grind, slow grind. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting. It's a matter of like you know, overnight successes um, take twenty years. You know, in the film industry, I would say that um, you know, or I actually really don't say twenty years. I say it's more like seven. Um, it takes anybody to to have some sort of success. Uh, early on, I my very first film was actually uh, quite successful. Uh, which was kind of crazy, um, and um, but it was all I distributed it myself. I you know broke box off local box office records with it. You know I wow. made money after the after two weeks. Uh, it, it enabled me to get invited to the Sundance Producers Conference because of just my my sheer willingness to get things done. Um, you know, so I've never had an overnight success or like anything blow up extremely huge. Um, but I mean I don't think about things like that. I think it more so yeah it'd be nice. But I think more so that I'm in it. I'm definitely in it for the long haul. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because I still own all my rights to all my films. The only film that we sold I mean, is the only film that that uh, I've not made money on. Um, and uh, so we literally, um, you know, we retain all the all the rights to all of our projects. So I get royalty checks every quarter uh, because you know I, I still own everything. Right. That's awesome. That's the way to do it. I think. Same thing with musicians too. The independent route. Um, what was going on in your head, I guess, in the in the beginning process, though, before your first successful film, like when you're maxing out credit cards and just all you had really was the vision before you actually had the success? 
Like well, what? it's interesting. Is 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 my very when I decided to to um, when I was in grad school, I went to grad school at Syracuse, and after my first semester, my professor Dana Plays was like, "What the hell are you doing going to school for?" And and I took that as an insult, quite honestly. And she's like, "No, no, no, not not to be offensive. It's just a matter of like I've never seen anybody put together a production like you've been able to with no money. You know why mm-hmm. why spend twenty seven thousand dollars going to school when you could." Uh, make your first film for that amount, just like John Waters. And little did she know, I was in John Waters' film Hairspray as as a dancer early on. Oh, really? Um, and oh, so it very it, it very much resonated with me, you know. And so um, I refinanced the only asset that I had at the time, which was a black Jeep Wrangler, um, and I refinanced my Jeep and started my company, and ended up producing my first film for you know right around twenty seven thousand dollars, which is kind of funny. Um, and so, um, I've been scrapping my entire life. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I've never like my family, although they started Dorney Park, my immediate family and my grandparents never got anything out of it. Um, you know, so we've really have always been workhorses. Like what I, I, I have a quote out there that says that we're not fancy filmmakers, we're grunts of creativity, mm. um, which is very much mm-hmm. how I, how I am. Um, I'm loading gear with my guys. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in it, you know, and, yeah. and I don't take the whole idea of like any, that I'm better than anybody else. I, it's a no. total team effort. Uh, I mean, my job, the driver, but, but at the same time, it's a matter of like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to dig in and, and, and get the job done. Uh, and not blame anybody because the only person that I can blame is myself for, for if we're not successful. Mm. I think that's totally on point, your level of accountability. And I think the story is really admirable as well. And the fact that you're kind of in there doing the grunt work as well just shows how how much you're invested into the actual project. And I think that's ultimately where great projects come from. Um, I think there's definitely a fine line between crazy and successful. So... <laughs> Hey, we'll be back in the episode in just two seconds, but before that, I do want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. So for all you aspiring producers and artists out there, I can't even begin to tell you how important having a mentor was to me. I would literally not be where I am today if it wasn't for people like Mike Moss, who is a three-time Grammy Award nominee. He got me my first credit, and Prince Charles Alexander, who's recorded Biggie and Alicia Keys. I wouldn't have been able to continue to grow and progress in my craft if it wasn't for them. So if you've been listening to the show and you heard episode 19 with Cato on the track, you know he's produced for B.O.B., Joyner Lucas, Hobson. He got token viral with his contest before anybody even knew who he was, and he totally blew up. The reason I'm telling you this is because he just opened up a mentorship program that will transition your music from being a side hustle to a career. If you want to learn the secrets from people at the top of the industry, go to bit.ly slash TMJ mentor and you can try it for free. That's bit.ly slash TMJ mentor. You kind of dance on that line until you find yourself on one side or the other and if you're successful... You know, everybody commends you after that and everybody's impressed. But uh, if you end up on that other side, then, uh, you know, not so much. But it's never too late either at the same time. What would you suggest to somebody who's kind of like dancing on that line? Like they haven't had that success yet, but they're very talented and they have the ability, but maybe don't have that level of accountability that you have, but uh, have all the Mm. ability in the world. That's hard uh, because talent's not going to get you anywhere. Right. Uh, pure talent's not going to get anywhere. I, 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 I you know, it, it takes a lot more than just pure talent. Totally. Um, and that's the thing. It's a matter of like, if you're not willing to do the work, um, you know, you're not going to be successful. You look at anybody that's successful. Look at P. Diddy, you know, what he was doing in his early career, like freaking fighting and, and, and you know, holding house parties and, and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Right. You know, right. You're, you're telling me that he slept easy at night? Hell no. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like you know, hard work. And perseverance pays off. It, it, it just, it just, that's actually a quote from my film. It's kind of funny. I quote it all the time now it, 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 <laughs> subconsciously. But, and, and the thing is, it's like, it's like sheer talent is not enough. You know, I mean, mind you, like, you know, you've got people that are, that are extraordinarily talented, but they put in all the work, all the practice, all the, all the other things that it takes to be able to get to that level. 100%. Um, you know what I mean? So it's not like, you know, you're not going to go out and, 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 you know, you know, play like, you know, Beethoven the first time you pick up a violin, you know, you know it's impossible. You know, yeah, so anything right. takes work. You just have to figure out whether or not you consider it work or not. I don't consider anything mm-hmm. I do work. I love it. I, and, and I've got no problem spending 20 hours a day on it. No, no, no problem. My wife has a little bit of a problem with it, but I don't. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, 
I guess it's just about kind of redirecting where you put the work, because if you put in the work to get good at the instrument, you have to redirect some of the effort into the actual marketing so that people hear you play the instrument, right? Oh, absolutely. So what's, what's been your biggest challenge? That's a great question, man. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot. Uh, I think competition is a big challenge. I think, especially in like the podcast thing, I mean, I've been really fortunate enough to have a lot of podcasters in my circle. So like Chris, for example, with No Quit Living, I'm connected with him. And then just all sorts of people who have kind of been through the learning curve of podcasting. So I've been really fortunate because I've been able to kind of learn the iTunes algorithm and I've ranked at number two in music. But uh, it's so awesome, think- dude. I'm so proud of you. Thank so you. I, I remember having a conversation. You're like, dude, how the heck do I get out? How do, how do I break out? Like, you know, like I want to do X, Y, and Z. And I told the my bit of advice back then, I think it was about a year and a half ago or so. It's just like, literally you have to keep at it. Yeah. You have, to, you have to keep consistent. That's it. That's exactly what it is. I'll say just because, uh, the podcast and releasing my own original music are my two, uh, I guess most recent entrepreneurial endeavors. So since they're the freshest, they're also the smallest projects that I have. Um, I think that networking with the right people and being able to offer them something of value has been kind of difficult for me, but I found ways to kind of leverage other skill sets. Like for example, um, the artist I told you about that I mix and mastered his new record, Kyle Mm -hmm. Bent. Um, he's somebody who's really connected in the industry. So because I was able to give him value in another way through mixing and mastering, he's been able to connect me with all these other people who can invest in me and put up cash up front and get things like Instagram verification and Facebook verification and all these other things that will help me grow my fan base in the future. So I think that's what it really so is. So what's your, what's your goal? What's your, what's your goal? Uh, I mean, I'm a person of influence, you know what I mean? Like I have this podcast and I have people like you, like amazing people who are in spaces that I'm not in to provide value to the people who are listening so that they can go on and be successful themselves. So that's kind of the goal with the podcast. Um, as an artist, I want to I wanna obviously touch people's hearts with the music and be relatable and be somebody that, uh, you know, somebody can kind of look up to and want to try to emulate. And I want to share different stories of things that I've been through. So that's kind of the goal. What about you? Um, I just want to keep producing uh, quality entertainment. Um, you know, I just, I just, I, I love what I do and I have my next project that I want to start working on once we get this all, all, all squared away. Mm. Um, but I feel this product's never going to leave, uh, just because it just, it just keeps going. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's interesting is because like I, I'm very much an entrepreneur and I love business. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I might end up in the, in the F and B industry at one point, um, food and beverage that is, uh, cause I love that. And, and I, and cool. I've done a lot of work in my, in my past in that, in that, uh, world. Um, but yeah, I just, I just love doing what I do. I love affecting mm-hmm. people. It's like, it's like when, you know, the, the lights come up after the film and see people like kind of like in shock, whatever they, they just saw. And then they want to talk to you about it afterwards. You know, that's exciting to me that, that, that's, that's really cool. You know, um, cause as artists, we have the ability to affect people, to inspire totally. people, you know, and also, you know, pr- to provoke thought. Uh, and that's a, that's a very, very, um, important tool that we have and we really need to uh consider it uh and how and of and the power that we have as well um and that's kind of an an important thing i think is that people have to realize that you know artists are the way of of communicating emotion and thought um and ideas uh across airwaves and through through visuals um that is a very very important part of 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 society and, and a matter of life you know, and so like, you know, um, I, I consider artists right up there with doctors and lawyers in yeah. terms of their importance in society. I think that's totally right. Um, I actually, I, I read this recent, recent study about depression and they took, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to quote it exactly, but uh, they took some people from the US who had depression. They took some people from Japan and they said to all the, all the people in the study, they said, do something that makes you happy. And uh, something like 80% of the Japanese people had their depression, not cured, but, but significantly better treated. And they found that the difference was um, the people in Japan, when they were told, do something that makes you happy, the people in Japan went and did something for somebody else, but the people in the US did something for themselves. So I think everybody 
kind of has uh, this underlying urge to, you know, better humanity and, and make somebody else's day better. But I think that it's really easy to lose sight of, especially as an artist, because so many people are trying to do it because everybody has this underlying urge. Uh, it's really easy to kind of lose sight of that and lose focus because at the end of the day, you do have to make sure that you're okay before you can help somebody else. Yeah. So I think it's important to to recognize that and remember it as any aspiring artist. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I do a lot of uh, speaking at colleges. Oh, really? Um, and yeah. And, and, I, and I do it uh, because one is I love to do it. And number two is because I'm producing in such a different way that it's definitely, you know, a... Um, an educational opportunity for students. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a matter of, of giving the students um, their own validation. Um, mm. You know, and I literally spend time and, and, and things like, I think I was at, I don't know, close to 20 colleges in the month of November, uh, wow. maybe December or something crazy. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's the matter of, um, it's not about me. It's about it, the, the common experience. Um, and that's the thing. Like I'm totally, I, I, I totally jive with what you're saying in terms of, you know, helping other people gives you a greater benefit than, than just helping yourself. Um, my industry, you cannot be selfish in because it takes a, an army of people to create what I do right, um, right. and things. And, and that's the thing. It's like, it's like, it's not, you know, yeah, you, you, you know, yeah, there has to be a singular vision and yada, yada, yada. But, but there's got to, you have to be able to inspire other people to be able to believe in that vision for the willingness to work with you. Totally, totally. You know, and, and that's the thing. It's like, too. yeah, absolutely. You know, and so like, I love that idea of, of, you know, feeling better about yourself is when you help somebody. Uh, and that's why we do a lot. Like I do a lot of things with artists as well. Um, I have this thing called Art Wars that I do. And then a thing with, uh, with kids called Art Spark. So we're constantly doing other things to help other artists. It just isn't all about us and what we're doing. Do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So, um, I was speaking in New York um, a couple of years ago. Oh, God, I got bet you it's almost eight years ago now. And I've always told anybody, like I speak a lot um, because I, I don't know why, but I just do. Uh, and, um, you know, I was saying that any filmmaker be, can make money. You just have to think about it and figure it out and stuff. And, and there was an artist there, a fine artist, a painter, and she raised her hand. She's like, well, I'm a painter. How do I make money? And uh, I, she stumped me. I'm like, well, you can sell your stuff. She's like, well, that's not enough. You know, mm -hmm. I, need to, I need to have validation. I need to have credibility, yada, 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 to be able to sell my artwork. So on the way home, um, you know, the drive home, I started thinking about it pretty intensely um, to the point that I missed my exit and ended up in central <laughs> Pennsylvania. Um, and um, I created this thing called Art Wars. Uh, so what Art Wars is, is we start with a, a throwdown. We're, we're, we're actually going to be probably bringing this to Boston. We've done it in Philadelphia. We're, we're doing it in New York as well. Cool. Um, so what we do is we have a throwdown. Any artist that wants to participate, you show up with your, with your art supplies, your substrate, and then the 16 people with the most votes end up moving into the series of the Art Wars. And how, the, how, how people get voted on is we sell voting tickets for $5. And then what we end up doing is half the money that we get uh, gets split amongst the artists that evening, and then the other half goes on to a grand prize. So there's four first round battles where we supply the substrate, the artist brings their own art supplies, two people move on to each round. Uh, the second round, we supply an ammo box full of art supplies and a substrate for people to create on. Uh, and then the finale, we give them $125 stipend to spend on their art supplies. We give them a, a theme to create uh, by. And they have two hours to create, and then the people, the two people, the most votes move on to the to the next round. Uh, and so, what we've done is we've gotten um, you know a lot of artists to participate in this, and so they make money every single time they're out there. They end up selling their artwork, um, and we've kind of built a whole community around it, and also offered a lot of cross pollination because what we found is that in a lot of cities, um, there's a lot of fiefdoms where if you're an artist, let's say with like mural arts in Philadelphia, you might not be at PAFA. You know, all these sorts of things. That's Philadelphia Art, um, Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts. Gotcha. You know, so like, there's a lot of these little fiefdoms that are, that are set up and not much cross-pollination. So our biggest mantra was that it, it has to be citywide and, and, it, and, and we are our own entity and we're not going to team up with any other organizations because we want to be like, you know, we want to be true to any artist that wants to participate. Yeah. So cool. like bars love us because we end up having these in live events, you know, live, live, you know, places and things. And so it's like, it ends up being crazy. You get, you get a couple hundred people out to see people freaking paint. It's pretty wild. It's really yeah. wild. 
For sure. Um, so we created that, and then we then somebody saw us do this, and then they wanted us to do it for kids. So we created this entire program uh, where we teach kids about creative, um, healthy living, where we do things about eating right and and um, you know eating right and and activity, and then also create you know like painting and, and dance and everything else. And so we kind of like celebrate the arts with these kids, and we have this whole like you know assembly program and everything else that we do around it as well. That's awesome, man. You're obviously doing a lot of really cool stuff. Um, I wish we could make this podcast longer so we could talk about all of it. I'll definitely have to <laughs> back on again. But unfortunately, it is almost our time. I definitely want to give you a chance to plug Art Wars and Billboard and everything. But there's one question I ask at the end of every episode before that, and that's if you had unlimited money, no strings attached, what would you do and why? I'd, I'd end up giving it to other artists. I, I get, I get, I get, yeah, un, yeah, I, just because like I, I just really, Drive on the creativity of others. Yeah, um, amazing. And if I can, if I can facilitate other people to be creative, um, I feel like I'm doing you know good in society. Um, you know, and and because it's not about me. Like like I can go make my own damn money. You know, and 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 <laughs> you know what I mean. So if I had unlimited resources, I definitely would help other people. Yeah. Would you give us any specific artists or just artists in general? Um. No, artists in general, just because like, oh, well, I know how hard it is for filmmakers to make a go at it. I know that. I also know how hard it is for musicians to make a go at it. Um, you know, but I, I would really say like any artists, um, even like, because the problem is in our society, we don't have a good creative class. Mm. You know, you don't have somebody that's a painter. You have a, somebody that's a painter and also a waiter or a bartender. Um, you know, and that's the challenge is like, we don't really have that much of a creative class in our, in our country. And that's something that I really, really would love to be able to help create. Mm. is the idea of, of, of creating, you know, where people could be a painter and they can, they can create. Um, we just don't have enough value in creativity in our country. Yeah, I think for sure. Um, I think the art wars idea is just kind of a testament to how creative you are because that's not something that you're even, that's not a space you're even directly a part of, but on no. your drive home, you, you thought of it. And, uh, and the painter that you were trying to influence hadn't even thought of it before either. So um, yeah, I love that answer, man. What yeah, it, it, it's also, it's, uh, it, you know, it's not about us. You know, as creators, it's not really like, yeah, we're creative because we have to be creative. But it's also, too, it's a matter of like, again, it's a matter of the community and a matter of the audience. Yeah. You know, and, that, and, and, and it's a shame that, that so many artists and everything else have gotten so self-indulgent and think that they're, that they're godlike, which is mm. so farthest from the truth. You're, you're, you're more like a pauper than you, than you are a god. Mm. Yeah, and that's 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 a humility that you need to have as an as as an artist. I feel, and I consider myself an artist, and that's why, like, I'm more than willing to help other people any day of the week. Yeah, I think as an artist and even just a human being in general, that level of humility is really important, and and staying humble in what you do. It's really the only way you can improve as well, because if you already think that you're up there and you're a god or whatever in whatever space you're in, uh, you know, there's nowhere to go above God. So yeah, well, look look at, look at Miles Davis. Miles Davis was like on the, on the top of the jazz world when he did blue. Right. Kind and, of so, blue and so, and, and so think about, think about like what he did. He improvised so far and went so far out there and then pulled it all back. Yeah. You know, but he was challenging himself and helping other musicians come up Always. You know, and everything else. It's like, and, and that's what you have to do is you have to like, you know, help other people come up, you know, and that, that's the thing, you know, 100%. You got 100%. me all fired up, Wes. <laughs> Well, they, say, they, say wanna, they say if you want to make a million dollars, you got to help someone else make a million dollars. We could talk yep. about this all day if we wanted to, but uh, if you want to let everybody know where they can find you for now, and then I'll have you I on the show that. for sure. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so um, please check out uh, what we're doing with Billboard at uh, billboardmovie.com. Uh, people can check out our virtual radio station, WTYT960.com, where people can basically submit their own music to. Uh, and then if you want to check out what we're doing with Art Wars and Art Spark, go to idreammachine.com. Uh, and please like our Facebook pages, you know, Billboard Movie, uh, WTYT, and I am Zeke Zelker. And I try and be everywhere, but not everywhere at once. <laughs> Amazing. Zeke, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thank you so much, Wes. This is great. So since today's episode's theme has pretty much been kind of like perseverance and overcoming challenges and small wins and always shooting your shot and trying no matter what the odds stacked against you are, today's feature that I chose to 
put right here and showcase his song, showcase his music, is this guy named Zeb Curry. He goes by Lil Freaky and he's on SoundCloud. And the reason why I decided to choose him today is because he's somebody who I think really embodies this whole theme of perseverance. He's one of the few people who are literally sending me their songs every single week without fail. He follows the rules. He doesn't send me more than one. He doesn't spam me like some people do. Just sends me one different song every single week, and I listen to every single one. And, you know, this is the kind of attitude you have to have if you want to be successful in whatever industry you decide to go into, especially the music industry. The fact that this guy has been so persistent and just continues to send me his music. I haven't had a chance to reply to a single one of his emails, but he always remembers to send it. Uh, I, I felt that this was kind of the right time to showcase his song, and I'm sure I'll showcase his music again in the future. But this is a song that he sent me. It's called Hit My Phone. It's not the most recent one he sent me, but it's the one that I kind of chose to feature. Um, and the reason is because I think it's a cool song. I like that he kind of plays around with the organ tones in the song. I don't know if he's doing it with a filter in post or if he's actually recording the organ with uh, with actual levers because there's different ways you can kind of manipulate the frequencies of an, of an organ. But I thought that part of the song was really cool. So here's a snippet he's going to play you out. And remember to keep sending your music to Wes at Home Studio Hits, H-O-M-E-S-T-U-D-I-O-H-I-T-S for a chance to get featured on the Music Journal podcast. And if you want to hear the full song by Zeb Curry, a.k.a. Lil Freaky and Slim X, just go to SoundCloud and search Lil Freaky and Slim with a dollar sign X hit my phone. Gonna see you around town with that fuck boy click Gonna hit you on the phone if I'm trying to get it in Got beans in my nose, got lean in my cup Baby, hit me on the phone if you really trying to fuck Bitch, leave me alone if you got two fucks Got that golf wearing shirt, got those five star trucks Trying to party with me, then you gonna blow trucks Got that golf boy click Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Music Journal. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to know more about me and what I do, I just put out a personal EP on Spotify. You can go to bit.ly slash Spotify. And if you want to know more about music production, I teach an online course about it too. Just shoot an email to wes at homestudiohits.com and I'll send you an application. Just for filling out the application, I'll send you a free sample pack of sounds I use to make the instrumental you're listening to and more. All these links will be available in the show notes so you can check them out there. And while you're there, if you feel inclined to rate this show five stars, that would really help me out. Other than that, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Thanks again. Peace.